welcome. Man, are we cool. Kate, I miss you. Baby. <laughs> We live yet? Oh no, we're recording. Good. So this is for posterity, right? Uh, all right. I awesome. No, I got no filter, Sarah. You're gonna have to shut me down. <laughs> well, so um, I guess we'll, we'll call the order the school board finance committee meeting for December 9th. Um, I want to start just by welcoming Kristen to the finance committee, and then welcoming back Leanne. Uh, Leanne, you were the chair of the finance committee, right, for a couple of years. Um, well, actually, it was like a couple of weeks, um, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, cool. So I want to, um, I think I had said like 60 minutes for this meeting. Um, I'm okay to, if that goes over a little bit. I do have a hard stop at five. I don't know what everyone else's schedule looks like. Um, but the two main topics I was hoping we would cover today is just to get an update from Kate on the uh, CRF, the coronavirus uh, relief funds and spending, uh, and then secondarily, just start the conversation around budget development. So I think according to Kate, they've already started talking about putting together a calendar. Um, and I know uh, those meetings are probably gonna kick off if they haven't already. So getting some insight into that and exposure um, early would be really useful. Leanne and Kristen, was there anything else you wanna add to the agenda? Nope. All right, cool. Thank you. I will uh, kick it over to you to start. All right, so uh, earlier today, not too much earlier because I kept getting delayed, I shared a, a document with you folks and posted it up on our website. So if anybody's watching this exciting program later on, they can go to the uh, Finance Committee page on our website and they'll see this under the supporting documents. I sent it ahead because it, the type is so teensy, but I was trying to do like a one page summary of each grant. Um, and to give both a little bit of background on what exactly is in the grant and then where we are in terms of a spending update um, as of, well, I put as of Friday because that was our last warrant and our last payroll. And uh, I, I do wanna just start by not talking at you, but having you tell me if there are areas that you really want me to focus on in this, or if you just want me to do like a line item run through high level. Um, I'll give you my take and then Leanne and Kristen can, can challenge that. I, I've, I've already looked through the document that you sent previously. Uh, if Kristen and Leanne haven't, then maybe just go through sort of a, a summary of each. Otherwise, maybe just a, sort of an overall sum summary and then an update if anything has changed since we put out the last communication. But Kristen and Leanne, what do you think? I did go through. Um, so sorry, Kristen, go ahead. No, you can go ahead. I was going to say, I did have a chance to go through. Um, I have questions and we can kind of catch them at the end of the conversation. Um, so I don't need, you don't need to go through each and every one because I did go through, but like I said, I have some questions for you. Okay. Yeah, I'm good with what you suggested there. Overview is good. Cool. So yeah, Kate, maybe if you want to start just by going through what's, what's updated since uh, the last report. Yeah, so let's, let's take a big step backwards. And when we put out a communication a while ago, the communication was mostly about what had we asked for, um, and a little bit about the parameters of the grant. So um, when we were talking about what's in the grant, what's it for, how does it work, um, those things haven't really changed, although the, the nitty gritty of it, the details of it, we've been working out with the Department of Education in terms of timelines and documentation and what's expected for reporting out. Um, so just to say that really briefly, we have this grant funding available to us for services and items purchased that are uh, in our hands by December 30 or services that have been provided by December 30, so the end of this month. Um, and uh, the documentation of that, that can involve payroll registers, payroll timesheets, 
uh, for the personnel side or piles of invoices and receipts um, for the purchasing side contracts. And um, the other big piece of this, and uh, apart from the timeline, is the fact that the funds are not allowed to be used for things that we originally budgeted for in our operating budget. Um, these funds were provided to give us extra support, supplemental support in the COVID pandemic environment to allow us to open and operate schools safely. So when you look at the categories of spending, you're gonna be looking at things that are going to be over and above what we would normally have budgeted for, what we did budget, budget for, for our you know, regular operating procedures, plus the extra that we put in for some of the COVID things we anticipated. Um, these are above and beyond those things. Um, so this first page is the CRF number one. It was the first grant that came out. It was broken into categories. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Do you mind just sharing it on your screen? So um, I thought I had it on my screen. You guys can't see that? Um, what I'm seeing is the agenda. Oh, hello. All right, <laughs> then. Let us close a few things here and try again. I've got too many screens open, guys. Sorry. All right, is that doing anything for us? Yep. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Awesome. And, and the tape is actually pretty big, so. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. The power of, of uh, the power of PowerPoint. Um, okay, so back to what I was saying, CRF number one, and we call it CRF, it's Coronavirus Relief Fund. But everybody's getting their acronyms out, uh, was broken into uh, these categories that you see and all districts in the state of Maine had the opportunity to, to apply for whatever they might need under these various categories. So each one of these has a label of the type of expenditure it's about, a description of what we actually put in our grant that we were going to use that money for, and so what we're, what we're using the, the funds for. Um, this first column right here is what was allocated to us in the grant. The second column in the blue is uh, the money that's been spent as of last Friday. Next column is what's left over. And then there's a few notes on the right side here, which I think are maybe disappearing a little bit on my screen. Here. Never really sure where the... Nope, we can see the full. Can you see the whole page? Okay, I'm yeah. never really sure where the sharing is ending here. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of notes in case there was something that I wanted you to know about what's going on still with those amounts. Um, you'll note that the biggest remaining balance, as I push up here a little bit, the total remaining balance that's unspent as of Friday is $300,000. The biggest chunk of that is in payroll because we'll have another two week payroll on the 18th for um, substitutes and supplemental work. Uh, that will also include uh, and you'll see in my note, it includes the uh, extra funding that we've provided for teachers and support staff to put in for extra unpaid hours um, under the two MOUs that we have with those bargaining units. And I will say that we've been receiving a very large stack of um, payment request forms, additional pay request forms. So people are taking advantage of that. And um, some really interesting and neat documentation of the kinds of work that have been done. Um, and those will get paid out on the 18th. And we'll also have uh, actually almost four weeks of supplemental substitute wages to go out, um, including you know payroll tax and main purse. So a good chunk of that 200,000 is going to disappear into that category. I also made a note that we do, do still have bills coming in for um, facilities, items, cleaning products, uh, PPE, and some instructional materials. And all of those things have been 
designated as COVID expenses based on the fact that they are needed for either um, facility support or personnel support in a pandemic environment or instructional supplies. Um, it doesn't actually state that in category C, but that was something that came out of conversations with the Department of Ed. Um, where we're using funds there are for not just, um, you know, a cart to push things around to different classrooms if you're, if you're working in a different environment, but also the instructional supplies. Um, and we may have talked about this before, but let's say you're in an art class and in the good old days in an art class, you'd have a selection of paints in the middle of the table and the kids would go on to the table with their paintbrush and they'd dunk into the paint you know, all together, they'd share and they share all kinds of things in classrooms, as I'm sure you know. Um, sharing is not a, a skill we're teaching right now. Sharing is a no-no. Um, so a lot of additional instructional supplies, little consumable stuff has been purchased in order to allow a child to have their own art kit or their own pencil case with the things that normally would be on the table to be shared. Um, I think that's sort of the high level piece. Um, maybe we should take a few questions and that might actually help drive um, other things that will come into my mind. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, Lynn, you wanna go first? I think you said you had sure. some questions. I do. Um, I know that we had to allocate all of the money and receive all of the goods by the 31st. Does that hold true for the invoices or do we have longer for invoices that come in for us, Kate? That has been our most popular topic of conversation actually in the past two weeks um, because uh, we don't always get invoices timely. We don't necessarily purchase something on December 20 and have an invoice in our hands on December 30. Um, that goes particularly for um, the district purchasing credit card. We have uh, mm -hmm. two of those. And also Amazon where we have a business account we order a lot of stuff on Amazon and Amazon is getting paid, but we're not actually posting those transactions to the general ledger in Eunice until usually a month later. Um, so the short answer to your question is that we do have a little leeway. Um, the, the state has been told that they have to wrap things up by the end of January. Okay. Um, I've heard a couple of different deadlines, January 15th, January 20th. Seven. Um, the the big the big rule is that you have to have the product and make the payment to the vendor by December 30. And it is the 30th, not the 31st, which is weird. But the the feds, or maybe it's the state. Somebody's decided that the 15th and 30th of every month, regardless of whether it has a 31, that that's their that's their end date for fiscal stuff. I don't know what they do with February. Uh, I didn't ask, but. Um, but to your point, Leanne, yeah, there's going to be invoices rolling in after December 30. Hopefully not a lot. We're asking most of our vendors to get everything in to us. Um, and, you know, as long as we know that the product is on the way um, and, you know, it's secured by our vendor, we might slide that, that check through and hold on to it until we're sure. Um, but it is, it's a, it's a touchy question because the timeline is pretty quick. The turnaround's pretty quick. It is crazy quick. Mm. Um, the other question had to do with the two areas that we had overages on, on the expenses. And it's, I think category is F and G. Yeah. Let me see. Um, are we able to reallocate funds from other categories to cover that overage or does that have to come out of general expense? Uh, no, actually, you see, I put a little yellow banner at the top here. Um, most of our federal, federal grants have a little bit of a float um, factor. As long as your overall grant total is expended, and as long as your expenditures meet the criteria of the grant, there is an opportunity to overspend in one category and underspend in another. So as long as your net is zero, um, so for example, on the buses, I'm pretty sure that the cost, or rather the vans, I'm pretty sure that the cost of fitting them out is gonna be about $6,000. Um, 
Uh -huh. um, in my conversations with Eddie down at Public Works, um, God bless him, big shout out to Ed here. Um, so I'm going to have $3,000 there that can go towards professional development. Um, that's a very, you know, fine statement, but what we'll do is we'll make sure that we preserve sufficient funding in these other categories where we have extra. Um, the other place where I think it's likely that we will have extra funds will be in category E in the, um, extra pay, the, the additional staff hours category just based on the, the stacks of um, requests for extra funding that are coming in. I'm not sure whether we'll hit the full 100,000 mark that was allocated for that. Um, but I, I also don't wanna say that that's the case until the deadline arrives, which is Friday um, for all those forms to be in. But to your question, an overage in one category, uh, categories F and G, does not have to go back to the general fund. It simply means that what we'll need to do is to preserve that same amount to offset in another category. Awesome. And then the other is more difficult to ask and it has to do in category E. Um, I know that the feds in their grand wisdom only gave us until the 30th, but Corona's not stopping on the 30th. What happens and do we have enough room to support the additional staff that we've needed to be open throughout the process? That is a really, really good question. And it's one that was tormenting us for quite a while. Um, you know, there was a hope that they might be able to extend the deadline out in terms of spending and we could have allocated more funding to humans and less to stuff. Um, that did not play out. The good news is that I did a little bit of a budget analysis um, about six weeks ago to answer that very question, because we know that from January, we things have not magically changed. No one has waved a wand and, and all of a sudden everyone can come back to work and we don't need any supplemental subs. Um, we're, we're all fully aware that that's not the case. Um, so I've done a budget to actual um, calculation on staffing and for a number of reasons one is normal payroll turnover uh, which we always have a little bit of savings or most always um, another is some um, unfilled positions um, special education hasn't been able to fill a number of the ed tech positions that they were hoping to fill um, a little bit of a perennial problem but um, especially so in this environment uh, bus driver positions where we budgeted for extra bus drivers and have not been able to find extra bus drivers and have been making do with what we have. Um, and the substitute lines that we currently have funded, which isn't a huge amount, but it would be the, available to us for this, uh, this purpose. So adding all of those bits and pieces together, we do have sufficient funding to support the supplemental staff that we currently have in place. That's great news. It is. And, you know, we, we had been uh, very cautious and, and I guess a little pessimistic at first when we hired supplemental subs. And I will say for the benefit of all of our uh, viewers that I'm sure are going to tune into this at some point, um, that when we're talking about supplemental subs, we have a number of staff members who for medical reasons are unable to come to school physically. Um, however, they are not sick and they are perfectly capable with the technology that we have in place of teaching at, uh, from home. Um, so for example, if I'm a teacher at the high school and I teach social studies, I can be hooked up to a projector in a classroom at the high school. I can be online with the kids. I can be providing content. I can be you know, accessing all kinds of web-based materials that I can share. I can teach pretty effectively um, in, in a remote setting. My problem is that I do still have kids at school. So there are, ch there are children in my classroom and somebody has to be there to facilitate their learning, to set me up on that, on that big screen and to make sure that the, the kids in the classroom have what they need and, and have adult supervision, at least to some extent. 
So the folks that we have hired as supplemental subs for the most part are doing a team teaching role in that way. Um, they're the person on site um, managing students in school and they are teaming with a, a teacher who is working from outside of the school, working from home. Um, so just wanted to clarify that. And when we first hired those folks, we said, we don't know how long this is gonna be able to go. Um, and we, we said to the folks who were teaching from home, we don't know how long this is going to be able to go. We can, we can um, commit to it till the end of, we did the end of the semester or the end of the uh, first grading period first. Um, but just recently we've said, look, nothing has changed. It's not, you know, it's not going to be an environment where doctors are going to say to their patients, sure, go back to school. It's going to be perfect. Have, you know, no worries now. Um, so we did, again, re work really hard to make sure we had the resources to keep the, those situations in place. And we have great subs, by the way. Um, there we go. And I, I'll also throw in there that we, we had conversations about what happens when we go fully remote. Mm -hmm. And I say when, because there are times when we're gonna need to go fully remote. Um, we've already done it on small scale with one classroom or two classrooms. Or, and, and chances are it'll, it'll continue in that vein. Um, those subs will still have a role because they will still be managing kids. And in most cases they've developed um, a a team approach with the students that they're working with. Um, and they're definitely, you know, part of that, that classroom environment. They're definitely adding value. And we've asked them to be prepared to, to hang with us and their, their duties might shift a little bit, um, but they're definitely, you know, a huge asset for us and we're really lucky to have them. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Other, other thoughts, questions? Katie, did you have any questions? So, Kate, we might want to table this until after you go through the number two. But my question is more on planning for the seemingly likely second round of funding that's coming. I know, you know, we don't know dates or anything like that or specifics, but I, I know that it was just approved by the House and, and looks hopeful for the Senate. Um, so I don't know if you want to take that now or, or table it until after the second review. Well, I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't put that on the table. I think that my wonder will be, um, I, I've seen in writing that the Cong that what Congress is looking at, there is some portion of that funding that is indicated to be helping schools. Mm -hmm. um, that's a fairly vague statement. I don't know what's in the fine print. Yeah. And this last round, uh, two rounds of funding came from the feds to the state of Maine who then decided how to alloc allocate it. Um, so I, I'm reluctant to be hanging my hat on any feeling of a guarantee that the schools will directly benefit Yeah. Um, from this new funding approach. Um, but that said, if we should get additional funding, um, we can certainly find ways to make use of it. We won't have the massive infrastructure investments that we've had so far. So I'm not sure how I see us spending $4 million. I'd really have to think about that really hard. Uh, but I can definitely see us spending, you know, another half a million on, on staffing. And that's, yeah. you know, staffing, supports, and you know, probably some sanitation. So if you want to shoot me a million, I, I can spend that fine. We can make use of it. Cool. Yeah, my, my thought process on that was kind of twofold. One, um, you know, maybe I know the timelines for this were like really quick and you guys had to turn around an application. And I think one of them was like in 24 hours or 48 hours, something like really short time. So I'm wondering if there's, and you may have already done this or know off the top of your head, but some work that we can do to say, if funds were to come available, here's what we're thinking of, of spending them on and sort of socializing that with the leadership council and, and getting their feedback and input. Mm. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because, I mean, this kind of leads into what we'll talk about next in terms of the budget process. 
there, uh, that was a big piece of our conversation, um, kicking off budget talks with the leadership team. Um, and we're, we're kind of having this vision of, okay, here's the old way we do things. Here's the COVID way. And then here's the new, what we hope is on the other side of all of this. Yeah. And, you know, what do those tracks look like? We don't think that new is actually just going to be, we go back to old. Mm -hmm. because So many things have actually changed and some for the better. Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot. Um, and, you know, I, don't, I think our leadership team is really being super thoughtful about what education is going to look like on the far side of this. So I think that ties into what you're saying, Sarah, is, you know, yeah. we might be making investments in areas that we wouldn't re really have thought of prior to, um, prior to this whole situation. And, and certainly when we were writing these grants in the first place, um, yeah, and I guess the only thing I would add to that too is, you know, just thinking about the some of the challenges we faced during the budget cycle last year, asking for money from taxpayers related to COVID, um, which I think people were reluctant to do, assuming that we would get funding. And of course, at the time, we didn't know that. So we had to plan for worst case scenario, and then we did, which is great. Um, but I think you know, looking and, and there may be time restrictions or whatever, but I think looking into next year and, tr and trying to be a little, you know, planning and proactive, if there are, if we do get money and if there are things that we can spend it, that would set us up for success next year. Whereas we, we don't have to rely as much on a tax base. I think that would be really beneficial and, and be beneficial for all of us to be able to stand in, in front of town council too and say that we were proactive in planning for this and using you know, the grants that were available to us first. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know that's going to be a big piece of the, of the puzzle. And, yeah. um, you know, there are going to be things that we can say already that, oh, well, guess what? You know, in our CIP, we're not going to be looking for floor scrubbers because we just got all the floor scrubbers we need. And, you know, sure, they're, you know, yeah. they have a lifespan, but we're- But we're we, did get, we did get Todd Shed, so. We got know. Todd Shed, right? <laughs> right? We have a shed. And, you know, we have, we have technology up the yin-yang. And, you know, I don't really want to think too hard about what that's going to look like in five years from now when all that stuff starts breaking. Yeah. Uh, Vaughn and I are already thinking about a, you know, replacement cycle for these things. Okay. Um, but, yeah, it was definitely- what I hope for is for the feds and the state of Maine to have a pretty clear idea of what's coming and when and what the parameters would be before we have to nail down our budget proposal. And that would be so ideal. And, you know, we'll talk about that more when we talk about budget timeline, mm -hmm. um, but for absolutely sure. And really what we've asked the leadership team to do just to begin thinking about this is, is to have that kind of tiered conversation with themselves. Like, and with their and with their staff and their leadership teams in their buildings, like okay, what's what's old that we need to get back? What's new that we want to preserve? What is school going to look like if it's still, you know, super COVID and F, all of FY twenty two? What's it going to look like if we're a little bit more back to normal? Yeah. Uh, so they're already thinking in terms of multiple scenarios, and I think in that process you could easily identify the things that if there is federal money available, that that would be a great place to allocate that money. At least that's my, that's my preliminary thought. Yeah, no, that, that sounds great. All right, so, so let's scoot to CRF2 because mindful of the time, I'm already halfway in here. And Kate, I just, sorry to interrupt you real quick. For Leanne and Kristen, if you guys have questions, just chime in because I'm not looking at the blue hand or whatever. So just speak freely. Okay, thank you. This is a very rowdy environment. Yeah, we like to keep things fast and loose here. That's right. Finance. It's a thing. All right. Um, so this one, I, I borrowed the, the format from CRF number one to build a grid for CRF number two, because I think if you looked back at what we shared in terms of the application, it's in a different format. It's in the GEM financial system and it's all kind of wordy and um, it's, a, it's much more of a narrative and much less of a grid. Um, so this is my one page version stealing the original uh, format and just chunking it out in the same way. Um, 
this is the second grant. This was the one that came sort of late in the day. And um, it's a lot more focused on specific items, um, more big ticket items, I think. So like this is where the shed lives in increasing instructional space. And this is where those floor scrubbers live in improving sanitation, improving air quality is um, that project is uh, air quality, what's the word, um, assessment? Now there's a better word for it. Um, we have a consultant that came in to actually run through all the buildings and do air quality testing. Um, and then purchasing actual air filters. Now air filters, the kind that you have in your home or in a business, they don't capture virus particles. They're not going to save us from COVID-19. What they are going to do is clean the air and reduce allergens and reduce particles and, and improve air quality um, to the point where folks aren't going to be having quite so many other things going on, like allergies that mask themselves and pretend to be COVID or colds and flu that mask themselves and pretend to be COVID. Um, so it's, um, it's actually a really neat infrastructure investment um, and it ties in nicely to the whole public health piece. Um, I sort of jumped ahead here. The first section is um, hybrid learning model. This is the second piece of um, technology investment. And this is specifically geared towards um, the audio systems in the classrooms. Most of this material is in already. You can tell by the amount budgeted and the amount expended. Um, but that's gonna be a really good bonus for us. It's, it's a huge bonus in the COVID environment because when you're wearing a mask and you're trying to teach kids in a room and at home on a laptop, um, we're finding that vocalization is really difficult. Like right now I'm not wearing my mask and it's great because I can shout into my laptop. But if I were in a classroom with kids, I'd have my mask on. And um, so you have uh, a layer of kids who have hearing deficits or are trying to learn to articulate language, um, young kids who are learning um, speech and vocabulary. And then you've got that second layer of just your normal um, uh, normative kids and adults who can't hear one another because there's a physical barrier there. They can't articulate. Um, so these are classroom um, audio enhancement systems and most of those are actually in, they're not installed yet, but the, the most of the equipment has made it into our hands. The outdoor space thing, we had some of that in, in CRF number one, but we really went to town on that in CRF two. And you see, I have a note there. Um, we've actually been looking at, two vendors have offered us quotes on these sort of picnic table cover things. I don't know if you've seen those, but it's it's actually like a built structure out of made out of wood, um, shingles on top and pressure treated wood. And um, they're actually really lovely. And we were thinking that we could install those instead of the tents that are out there or that have been out there and, and have to be taken in in the cold weather and that we would have um, some permanent outdoor structures. One of the things that we're learning in this environment is that kids really thrive outside and that teachers really enjoy having an outdoor learning environment. And we've seen that you know, in this small way with the Wentworth Garden, which is just such an amazing learning space. We've seen it in a small way with playgrounds, um, but kids really do enjoy being able to sit outside and draw from nature or sit outside and, and spend some time in the fresh air doing an activity. So that's something that I don't think will go away. It's kind of like what I was saying before, there are things that we've learned about teaching and learning that, that are really valuable lessons that we can carry forward. Um, public hygiene is a, is a, a super popular category that's um, sharing water fountains and sharing bathrooms and things like that that have suddenly become a little bit of an issue. Um, we're trying to mitigate that because it's healthier for everybody, whether there's a pandemic or not. Um, jumping around a little bit, but I think, uh, again, I think I'll ask, quest ask four questions and that might sort of guide more of my speech to you. Uh, 
I don't have any particular Kate. It was a good summary. I will say that this one is, um, uh, we've got a little more spending to do. Again, this was the second go round and um, there's some fairly big ticket items that we're still lining up. And that's why having that little bit of leeway on invoicing will be helpful. Um, but we're pretty confident that we'll have everything that we need lined up and in hand and paid for, um, you know, the, so that the effective date of December 30 isn't an issue. And this is all stuff, not people. So yeah. um, less in the way of unknowns with stuff than there is with folks. Other questions about that? I'm good on this one. Awesome. So um, just to, to maybe wrap this up, Leanne, I, I wonder if, if there's a possibility for an upcoming uh, like a communications just to, to provide an update on this, maybe mm -hmm. after December 30th, once we've completed the spend, just to, to tie a little bow on it. Um, yeah, my guess is that it'll take me a little bit of time to um, to report out to the state, make sure I hit their deadline, and then turn around and be able to put it into layman's terms a little bit better for our team. I'm going to show you something that, like, I have this this little line to give you. This is this right here. This is two monthly invoices oh, gosh. to the state. That's, <laughs> That's intense. Yeah, I mean, it, paperwork wise, this is insane because it's the government, uh -huh. right? And, you know, we love paper. Um, of course, it's all, I, I scan it all and then it's all in a PDF somewhere, which is lovely too. But um, just my, uh, my worry is that I wouldn't be able to turn on a dime and then and, and report out the 1st of January, but I would definitely be wanting to, ab to, wanting to be able to do it in the normal course of events as a second quarter report um, with the yeah. second quarter ending. I was even thinking like higher level than that, right? Like here are some like very top level exciting things that we've been able to do with this money, like install sort of air sanitation and purification systems that are not just better for COVID, but are just better forever for everything, you know? Yeah, well, Things yeah, like definitely. I'm thinking of it in terms of a great big old financial report, but really in, in terms of what folks in the community would like to know, I'm sure like a picture of an air filter that says, hey, there's one of these in every classroom now, or water bottle, water, water bottle fillers instead of your kid putting their spitty mouth on the water fountain. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it might be better to think of it in terms of what you get for your money and isn't that cool? And I know this, this is, is pretty really, high stuff. This is super short notice, um, but I got a note from Kelly today that we don't have a topic for the upcoming town newsletter, which we would just need to have something turned in by Friday. Um, and maybe it is just something short and sweet to this is what we've been able to do so far, but we'll have more information coming or we could wait until a January newsletter because that would get that broad reach to the full community who I think is where you're really targeting, Sarah. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I would take advice from the communications committee, but I think the, the goal of putting out the FAQ and I think with this is to make sure that people know that it's like a public process, that it's transparent, that we're not doing any, like there are very specific rules that we have to follow um, and guidelines and that we're not doing anything tricky. Like, yeah. and, but also call attention to the things that are gonna have long lasting benefits and, and mm -hmm. that by doing them, we've actually saved town money because there's things that we probably would have had to do that we were able to do with this funding rather than tax dollars. It's kind of the gist that I was thinking. Okay. Um, if you want, Leanne, and, and if you're the person who's likely to be working on drafting something like that, I can send you this PDF as a, um, I think I've got it in Excel actually, because that's where I do everything, of course. Um, so that you could cut and paste and maybe just pull a, a few little examples. 
that would be great. Um, and, and that way, uh, you, you could decide what you thought was was a, a sexy read for the the community newsletter instead of it just being like, oh, here, read this really dry two page grid of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll do that um, like right now. Cool. And Kristen, are you on the communications committee too? Yep. Oh, perfect. Good. Um, Good. And the, the um, Excel version of this has a couple of uh, backup tabs with some line line item accounts, but I think it'd be easy for you just to pull language out of individual cells. Okay. And Katie, I'll get something drafted and get it over to you and Shannon to look at. So you're going to aim for Friday? I know I'm an overachiever, right? <laughs> uh, don't stress yourself. Wait, I was saying today's Monday. Do you, don't stress yourself out by doing that. If, it, if it's in January, it's in January. Um, well, well, we have it's, the, it's the open question. spot. It's a, it's a good question, though. I mean, is it is it good to just say... Um, maybe it's like a teaser, or maybe it's like, hey, you know what, we've been spending away on really cool, fun things. Here's some, you know, here's some highlights and look forward to a more um, in depth report once everything is done. Yeah. Leanne, I'm happy to help with um, another set of eyes on that if that's helpful. Diane, thank you so much. I like that idea, Kate, of a teaser because I think that. Yeah to do justice to some of the stuff that you've been able to do, we can't do that by Friday. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I, I don't think you wanna be flip about anything. You wanna be thoughtful about what's gonna resonate mm -hmm. with the community. Um, and, uh, you know, we might be able to go into a little bit more detail or, or have some more photos of things in action or, you know, yeah. I have a picture of, a, of a, some sort of backhoe taking apart the, parking lot at the bus garage, digging a hole. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> but it might be more exciting to actually see like uh, something with walls. If we can get pictures of kids outside, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Maybe maybe Todd's garage is not the thing we want to put on the front page. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm already making jokes about parking dump trucks in poor Peter Hayes's driveway so you don't, you don't want me to be in charge of the outreach on this <laughs> uh, cool i'm a bad person no no awesome i think uh that was a good uh leanne or in kt any final thoughts on crf oh this was great awesome so for the budget development um do you actually have a, a draft calendar kate uh, we don't yet. We have last year's calendar and we have, well, actually that's not true. Diane put together a very nice sort of new version of the old calendar, which kind of took the elements of last year's calendar and plopped them into the correct dates and, and timeframes for the new year. Okay. Um, but the conversation that we had today at the leadership team kind of changed that up a little bit in terms of what they were hoping to accomplish. Um, just really high level in December, last year and you know typically um, December is the time when I'm sitting in the dark building the salaries and benefits worksheet and the leadership team is working with their teams in their buildings to figure out what their level services budget is going to look like so there's not a really big public face to that piece um, we did have the staff listening sessions in December before the Christmas break last year. And we felt like, you know, those really, those are awesome. Those are the, the sessions when the superintendent and I and some board members and you know, various other leaders, the building leaders would gather in a, a quiet place where teachers could come and bring us their thoughts and ideas. Mm -hmm. um, amazing feedback loop, really, really nice. But in this current environment and with the stresses around us with our, with our staff, the leadership team felt like they might wanna tackle that in a little bit different way. Um, and so their recommendation, again, this is all stuff we talked about today, so it's pretty fresh and we haven't really fleshed it out. Um, but they, their 
um, thought was to have um, more a formal building based process rather than, you know, I'm Kelly Crosby and I'm bopping around to classrooms checking in on people and getting the temperature of things and talking to my leadership team and casual conversation, it's going to need to be more formal, right? Because people are, are more programmed and scheduled and we're trying not to be in each other's space yep. more than we need to physically. Um, so a uh, suggestion was that they could do some um, Google Meets, Google Hangouts with their staff and be able to gather more information and then bring central office into it um, towards more towards the end of that process because mm -hmm. they won't have the capacity to do the more informal stuff. So then the big target date for our internal process is uh, Martin Luther King week. Um, the middle of January, uh, and that starts two weeks of individual meetings with building principals and department heads to um, nail down their level services budget. Mm -hmm. uh, also during that time, we have our team bringing any new proposals that they have, so the investment piece that we talk about separately. Um, and you know, this year we're, we're thinking that that's not really going to look like new and innovative stuff over and above what we need to do to get through. Um, the conversation we had today and this, uh, I think I'm going to throw this back to you guys a little bit. This, this leads into the, the um, nature of our relationship with the town council, the, um, collaboration that we engaged in last year where we, um, felt as though we were working towards a common goal and then COVID happened and the goal got derailed. Yeah. The process got derailed. Um, from my perspective, it was very painful and uncomfortable at the end of that process. Throughout the whole process? Well, you know, I think we got, we got to, to March and, you know, the leadership team had done their thing and had done good work and had brought a proposal that met those original goals to the table. Um, and so we're all going, yay me, and then all hell breaks loose. And um, it was very demoralizing for our team. It was demoralizing to have to deconstruct a, an appropriate and responsible budget. It was demoralizing to have to do that in an environment where um, administrators were quite frankly being demonized as, you know, trying to fire people and um, trying to uh, cut personnel and making the wrong decisions. And, you know, it was, it was a, um, a quite an uncomfortable battle, I think, for our leadership team. And so I'd, I'd really love not to do that. And I don't think we have to do that this year because we're not going to be surprised. We're not going to be taken by surprise, by our, our fiscal environment, by our, our community's needs and worries and wonders. Um, and I think that the takeaway from that conversation with our team was, we need a couple of things. We need to, to have a new goal and we need to be realistic about it. So that leads us to, you know, what's the relationship with town council finance committee? How are we going to try and, you know, front load some of those conversations? Mm -hmm. We need to have a goal that we can meet and be comfortable with and be confident in whatever the restrictions are, whatever the parameters are, let us do that work. Mm -hmm. And then, and then secondly, you know, if, if things go off the rail, off the rails, um, you know, staying collaborative, staying true to our mission, um, staying trusting of one another's decision making. Uh, that's going to keep us afloat. Yeah. I appreciate that feedback. I think that's really helpful and thinking through this year. Um, I've thought a lot about this year and I don't have any fully formed suggestions or opinions yet, but I do want to do things differently. Um, and I, th I think that the way that we've gone about it in the past, and I almost, I almost like hesitate to change anything too much, right? Because like we've, we've passed the budget successfully. 
on the first try the last two years, but it's been a really painful process. And, and I don't want to put anybody through that. Uh, and especially not what we went through last year. Um, well, I think one benefit is we're dealing with a different town council. So I think that's a, that's a positive. Um, and the town council finance committee in particular, um, I think are really eager to collaborate and work together. I want to move away from this notion of collaboration. And I don't say that, I don't mean to say that in a sense of we shouldn't talk to them, we should surprise them and just show up at this meeting with this information and, and kind of otherwise like do this cloak and dagger approach. I mean, we can, let's chat with them, let's have a conversation. But at the end of the day, they tell us the goal, you guys put together the needs-based budget and then it's it's sort of accepted. Or, or if they have questions on it, ask the questions. But it's not something necessarily that is we're working on in collaboration with them because we don't. That's just like a fact, right? We don't really go through this collaboratively with them. And so I think when we say that it's collaborative and we have these joint meetings, the perception is that they're involved in this process along the way. And that just really hasn't been the case. Um, and so again, I don't how to how to put that into practice. I don't know. That's just some of my my early thoughts. It would be great if we could be in a position, in my opinion, that would you know, really love to hear what Leanne and Kristen think. But it'd be great if we can get into a position where we're treated the same as the other departments. So, you know, Sandy or and Kate go to a meeting similar to the head, you know, the chief of police would do or that Todd Sousa would do or whoever and say, this is, this is what we need. This is what we need to operate. Take it, ask questions, poke holes in it. Um, but this is what we're telling you we need. And then at the end of the day, they take all of that information together with the other departments and come back and say, okay, you need to cut by X amount. And then you guys go away and you do that work. I'm making it I'm way oversimplifying it, right? But I think that we've almost overcomplicated it over the years by introducing all of these other steps. And really, if we just go back to the basics of what's our role, what's their role, maybe it would create less confusion. Thoughts? Um, I, I think that's that's a really interesting observation, Sarah, that, you know, we in in trying to be collaborative, we may have introduced too much um, putting the ore in and and stirring um, from from all parties. So that's interesting. It, and our new finance chair on the town side, um, Mr. Cucci, is is very interested particularly in process and who does what and at what point you know who's the authority over what so i think i think he would be very interested and receptive to a conversation about those the delineation the lines of of, of authority and and who brings what where i would say that it's my understanding that the board provides a budget to the council so you can't you can't really avoid that it can't just be like we're a department of the town and so yeah. department administrators show up at the table um, but i think you can still operate that way you can still say um you know sure we're just another branch of the town here's what we're doing we're, and we're describing it in the same way that public safety is describing their needs yeah that's that's almost what I mean though, right? Because I think you're right, right? That's the way that our charter, well, first of all, the policy is we don't really follow it anyway. I don't think we have based on like the timelines and the sequence. Um, so that probably needs looking after anyway, but um, like if, if it's our job to present it to town council, then so we have that meeting and then you guys still, like there's still that department meeting so that's what I mean. It's almost like redundant and confusing. And like, why are we having all these separate meetings? Shouldn't we just streamline that? Is, is my right. And we've always had that wonder about, you know, the we're sitting together, collaborating, we're talking about goals together, we're setting goals and we're, you know, we're sharing information about one another's budgets and one another's needs. And then we turn around and we have this, you know, you present your budget to the town council um, and you know they're they're on the big stage and we're in the little chairs and you know it, 
it, it's always felt a little peculiar trying to mesh those two things. And I personally, I would love to be a little more clear cut and just have the council say, here's what we need, get it done. And we bring it back to them and say, we did it. And not have folks trying to, um, or feeling like they have to be, have more expertise and understanding than they really do. I think it's an interesting thing for me to have this conversation now, because in the last few days, I've been thinking about the comprehensive plan. And I've been thinking the exact same thing, that the relationship between the board and the council is, it's interesting in why we're so different from how they're treating the library in their process to add on to their building. Why is this our new school so different for them? Like, and why aren't they offering us the same financial assistance that the library gets? They see us very differently. And I don't know that it's a great thing that they mm, see us. That's a good point. You know, like it's just, it's been in my mind. So it's interesting that you're- Yeah. You're bringing it up. Sarah, have you had any uh, conversation with the town at all? Um, I haven't. I wanted to wait and, and chat with you guys first and get yeah. your thoughts. Yeah, I'd be interested to know how John sees all this. Yeah. Um, because he's a very different person from Peter and, you know, and from Don and some of the other folks that we've sort of, we, we've built these relationships with. Um, I think he might have, have a little bit of a different worldview as well. And it, it's quite a different committee if you look at the dynamics of the, the finance committee this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Liam, what do you think? Um, I think what you raised is a really good point. At times it has felt that the familiarity between the two committees has almost invited council to come in and behave very differently than they would anybody else. Um, we've worked hand in hand, so they feel um, the word entitled is strong, but they feel it's okay to question why do you need X number of staff when other people are doing this. So it, I like the idea of our creating this is our needs and then presenting it and keeping almost a line in the sand between the two teams. Kristen, you, you nailed it. There is a very different philosophy between how they treat other groups and their asks and how they treat us. It's not given the same respect or um, thoughtfulness. It's always a challenge. And I've wondered if it's because we've tried so hard to be really close with them. Not saying we should not have a good relationship because that's not it. I think we need to definitely. But it would be interesting to see if we came back and were clear of this is the goals, this is what we need to operate and to operate successfully. And if it had a different approach and a different tact. Yeah. I mean, ultimately the way it should work, right, is mm -hmm. Diane and Sandy and, and, and Kate should come together and say, this is what we need. And town says, well, Tom just told us what he needs and combined with what you need, that's too much. You guys got to cut some. Okay, go back, Diane, Sandy, Kate, go back and cut some. And then, you know, we go back to them and that's, you know, we get so in the weeds, I think, and the public therefore becomes distracted almost because they don't even know what's what because there's yeah. so many meetings and so many conversations and any way that I think we can streamline that, I think is going to be to the benefit of, of everybody. And I want to be really clear. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk to them and be open with them and partner with them. I just don't mm -hmm. think it's a collaboration. Yep. That's agree. interesting from the perspective of history, because I'm the old lady in the room here. And we, we built the relationship with the town council finance committee initially because we felt that the decisions that they made that affected the schools were arbitrary because they didn't know what impact it would have to say, hey, schools cut a million dollars, Yeah. right? Um, you know, we're really sorry schools, but we don't have that kind of money. So just, you know, go, go away and come back with a smaller budget, right? So 
that statement's been being made for 20 years. And that's just only because I've only been here 20 years. I'm sure it was made 20 years before that. Go away and bring us something smaller, right? So the collaboration piece, interestingly enough, hasn't changed that. It's still go away and bring us something smaller. And what we hope the collaboration would do would be to give the town council and town leadership a footing on which to stand to say, oh, wow, you know, maybe we shouldn't make that decision. Maybe we should actually um, understand more why the resources are needed and therefore support that. Um, and I don't think that's quite the outcome that we got. I think the outcome that we got was still go away and make it smaller, but now we're gonna tell you how to do it because we know more about your business. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, good, I, it's a good point though, I think, because there needs to be a balance that it's not, that we don't lose that. We don't lose that sort of needs base and understanding. And so I think Part of that's on us to make sure that that's communicated effectively in the presentation. Um, but I think you're right, Kate. That's that's a good point. Well, and, and again, I'm not I'm not discounting any of the things you're saying, Sarah. I agree with you. No. Um, I'm. I guess what I'm saying is that we had a goal that we were trying to achieve in behaving that way with that team and yeah. creating that collaboration. Um, and, you know, to some extent we achieved it because we have people, I think, people on the council who do understand a little bit more where school budget money goes and what it's used for. Um, but I, I think that the, uh, I think someone used the word entitlement that came with that knowledge hasn't been helpful to us. I totally agree with that. It's an interesting thing. That is the downside. We are still just being told cut and then now they have an opinion on where but you know to your point Sarah I think we need to do we definitely need to make sure in the process that there's still that opportunity for us to advocate so if they do say you need to cut a million dollars where we get to say okay but these so you know these are the consequences for your cutting that money I mean we obviously at the end of the day have to do what they tell us to do but you yeah. should definitely know what their what the fallout is yeah. yeah, and I, I would so much like to avoid that conversation being um, harsh, you know, and it's hard because you feel like you're, as a, as a school board or as a school leader, you feel like, you know, somebody's wrapping you over the knuckles with a ruler and saying, bad girl, what are you doing? Um, it, it doesn't feel very uh, adult and, and respectful when you're in those circumstances but at the same time I think it's it's important for us to you know, stay calm say okay this is what it is it's a financial decision it's not an emotional decision decision it's not you know the, the favorite thing is well you can have a police officer or you can have a teacher that is so not the dialogue that I want to be no. in no um it's it's not helpful so there's that balance between doing our job, which is to advocate for our students, to advocate for the resources that we need to provide effective teaching and learning in a safe environment. And then also to, you know, to acknowledge that there are restrictions, that there are, that there are environmental factors, financial environmental factors that are going to restrict our ability to have all the funds that we would like to have. Mm -hmm. Enrollment's going to be an interesting conversation. That was part of our conversation this morning. Yeah, we've we've been having this whole conversation about you know buildings getting too small and the town growing and you know the kids are coming and then you get COVID and you get oh well maybe I won't send my kid to kindergarten. Right, I'll hold them back a year. Maybe we'll do homeschool. So our enrollment numbers are very weird and and you know we talked about that this morning with the leadership team. Like how on earth are we going to be able to know? our projections were right on up until the pandemic. And we're, we're very confident in that. And then, and then, you know, now we're like, oh, okay, can we still um, bank on that? And when does it turn around again? Do we get this huge bubble at Wentworth in a couple of years when everybody says, hey, everything's great. Let's all go back to school. I was actually thinking about that for next fall and what kindergarten classes are gonna look like. And when we have, you know, 
five kindergarten classes in each one of the three buildings. Right. Last year's kids and this year's kids, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting problem to have. Yeah. Sandy's got his hand up. Yeah. I don't want to turn too quickly here, but I, I think we're reflecting on last year and, and I, I would like to reflect on, you know, the relationship between the administrative team and the finance committee from the board. Um, and again, when I bring this up, it's no fault of anybody. And I sincerely mean that everybody had good intentions, but what felt a little backwards. And again, I come from a different district in the past in different budgets. What was hard for the administrative team was we made a decision whether it was right or wrong to reduce staff, right? And we quickly heard from the public, you quickly heard from the union, and things really began to spin at that point in time. On one hand, <clears throat> the work that the finance committee did, it helped in the long run because it, it reduced the amount of staff that had to be riffed. In doing that, and I don't think it was intentional, and I can't speak for the whole administrative team, but it felt like you, that the school committee finance committee kind of saved the budget, saved the people, and the administrative team, I think felt like, wow, you know, we were just kind of thrown under the rug, um, not intentional, it just, it's the way the process kind of unfolded. Now, at the end of the day, I applaud the finance committee because I think you were able to find other ways to reduce the budget and not reduce staff. That being said, I just wonder if there's a way to reflect on that process from last year and see if we could do it so that the administrative team, maybe up front, if, if the marching orders is do not cut staff unless you absolutely have to at the end. And maybe that's how we could start this year because it just felt a little backwards. And again, I, I haven't been here long enough to know if you did that every year, but it just felt kind of quirky to me. And I'm just being, I'm trying to be helpful, but I'm trying you to know, be honest. I appreciate it. Yeah. I say the same thing I said, Kiki, I appreciate that feedback. It's honest and I think it's fair. Um, I think that's maybe a discussion that we need to have early is what, what are our goals for, for this year, right? Because I guess I would say, of course, we should do whatever we can not to get rid of staff. But if our goals are different, then then maybe that's a necessary evil. So I think it's a, it's a we need to be aligned on what the goals are early on and then I completely agree with you Sandy it's it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that whatever decisions we're making are aligned to those agreed goals that we have really that that you guys have that you tell us what you think is right yeah. and if I can just add one piece to that I think it would also be really helpful that if decisions are made that they're joint decisions and that they're not um that neither one team or the other is being held responsible for them, yeah. that it's decisions that we are making together. Um, if it's, we're doing this at board directive when it's not actually board directive, I think that could sometimes create a little bit of a, a little shift. So as long as we're working in collaboration, I think we can do exactly what's being asked for. I agree. Okay, I realize we're over time. I have one other thought. If you guys have a couple more minutes. Uh -huh. My only other thought, and this might be a little provocative, is that we don't use the word or we don't frame ass as investments this year. I wonder if that's going to be a little bit of a trigger given the economic situation. And I'm not saying we don't ask for, for things that we need, but I'm wondering if maybe there's a different way that we can frame it so that it's not seen as 
we're investing during a time where people are just kind of scraping by. A really good point, sir. I think mm -hmm. the word investment implies, you know, a strategic ad of something that you haven't had before. Um, and you know, in in most cases, if you look into the into the fine print of what we've been calling investments, it's you know adding a program for kids, or it's adding uh, staff because of enrollment, or it's adding staff because of special services. So there's there's definitely if there's a change in, in, in personnel, for example, where we need more personnel, there's definitely a different way to frame that. Mm. It's not really an investment, it's a response to student needs. Yeah. It's a need, um, yeah. To enrollment yeah. or what have you, but that's a really good point because you're right, the word investment implies that, you know, we've got everything we need and now we're doing an add-on. Right. Yeah. And, and in, in some cases it is, you know, in some cases it's, hey, unified basketball, what a great investment. We didn't have it before. We probably could have lived without it, but damn it, let's do that, mm -hmm. you know. But, it, but in most cases, I think this year, I don't think we're going to be looking to, um, I don't think our leadership team, I, at least I hope after our conversations that I don't, I don't think they have a pie in the sky approach here. I think they have a, how are we going to figure out what we need to carry on? Mm -hmm. It's more the wonder mm -hmm. with a lot of variables, a lot of questions. But yeah, I, I think I, I think the word investment should be like a little taboo. We'll find a new label. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, any Leanne? KT, I don't know if she's still there. <laughs> Any final thoughts? I, am. I had to turn my video off. I literally missed everything you just said. So I'm assuming the word we're not using is investment. <laughs> <laughs> Quick takeaway for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's all you need to know. Investment implies growth and opportunity, and we're just trying to hold the line. Yeah. Cool. Um, I will try and connect with John and just have a conversation with him about what his thoughts are for this year. Um, and then, uh, is there any need to meet again before Christmas or should we set another goal to meet in January? Um, from my perspective, I don't have any sort of compliance stuff that I need you guys to do. I've been sending you warrants. And Kristen, if you just still have a little bit of time, I can just spend a minute with you. We were gonna meet after this, um, but if not, we can also reschedule um, just to know how the warrants work, but um, January is fine for me. I'm gonna have uh, plenty to keep me busy this month. Okay, good. I see really? Diane. Are you sure? Diane shaking her head. <laughs> awesome. Well, I guess I just wanna end by saying um, Sarah, thank you I guys. Have... Oh, go ahead, Kristen. Can I just request that whenever we do, although I guess Leanne and I will know whenever there's a calendar available so we can build our communications schedule so the sooner the better if anything the budget have, calendar yeah whenever you have yeah that. yeah yeah good point okay. um and that's something that we have on our on our leadership team's schedule for the next couple of weeks just to carve out a little bit of time to make sure that we can nail that down but um the initial part of the process just so you know Kristen, is is pretty internal where there's not like a public facing piece until we get into later in the process, um, February, March. So we have a little bit of time as far as the communications outreach piece, but we do want to keep people posted on what we're doing. I created an FY22 folder, Kate, in our school board drive. I'm wondering okay. if maybe you could just pop in the draft just so Kristen and Leanne can kind of see yep. the rough dates. Cool. Awesome. Thank Great. you. All right. Um, I, I was just going to say, I really appreciate the honest and candid feedback that you guys shared. I think it's only going to make this process better. And I hope that you'll share back with the leadership council that, you know, we're, you know, there are things about last year that I also was not happy with. And, and I take responsibility for that as, as chair and, and we want to do better. And I think we want to collaborate as close as possible with admin and staff. Um, and maybe pull back on some collaboration from town council. <laughs> so choose awesome. your partners. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. That's okay. it. Thanks, Perfect. guys. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.